What is going on, guys? It is Filmington. Got a very special video for y'all. It is regarding the state of data in the hobby. And with this episode, I will be bringing on with me special guest Chris Cardi C. He joined me, I think it was last week or the week before, we discussed uh, the buyout of CLCT. So he's back with me here today. How are you doing, Cardi C? Doing fantastic. Thank you for having me on again, Phil. Of course, anytime, man. Anytime. So in this episode, we're going to be talking about um, specifically, and this might be kind of a geeky episode for a lot of you. So uh, might as well just stop watching now if you're uh, <laughs> not all about, you know, the analytics, the, the different tools and data that's available emerging um, in a marketplace that perhaps we didn't have two or three years ago. But, um, you know, on that note, there are a lot of tools available at our disposal today. Um, you know, you could look at eBay for previously sold items. You know, you might not get the full picture there, but there's other tools like PSA's website, PSA SMR. You've got the um, eBay tracking tools or uh, data tools such as Market Movers, as well as Card Ladder. There's probably a number of other ones out there. Um, and there's other tools as well. So that's what we're going to be getting into today. So. Chris, um, to you, is is data the the biggest pain point of the hobby today? In your eyes, from your perspective, um, how, how do you how would you weigh in on that at a high level? I think there's a lot of pain points in the hobby, but uh, for the type of collector that I am, the inability to quickly query a database or look up the price of something and have a high level of confidence creates a, an enormous market inefficiency and potentially a massive opportunity for someone that has the skills and the abilities to be able to put sort of a standardized set of sequencing into play and get all the major players on board. And we can talk about that a little bit later, but uh, to answer your question, I do think that data data integrity, data quality is the biggest roadblock and hurdle that our hobby is facing at this point um, in terms of inviting new collectors and investors into the world of sports cards and, and collectibles as a whole. Yeah, on that note of, um, of data quality, um, you know, I feel like hobbyists don't really often have full confidence in data quality. And data quality could be, is the data timely? Is the data accurate? Is the data complete? Um, you know, you look at eBay, of course, you're really only getting the data for the last 90 days unless mm -hmm. you use the TerraPeak service, which is available at, I think, a cost of $20 a month or so, or if you are uh, you already have a, a store membership. And that's, I think, only data from the last year certainly isn't the best to um to to query from the, the the trending and the analytical capabilities of that tool are a little a little rudimentary um then you have the market movers tool as well as card ladder and you know they're awesome um but kind of to quote uh to, to steal a quote from brian gray ceo of leaf think in one way we're in the second inning of a nine inning ball game. So I think as much as we've seen from those tools, um, they've been a great starting point. But I think if we look at those tools and other tools that spring up three years from now, we'll be seeing completely different, you know, um, level of technology. So uh, as far as I'm aware, those tools, market movers, uh, card ladder, I'm pretty sure they're limited in the amount of data that they can import on a daily basis, um, which presents an issue. Um, you know, we, we talked about how data exists in eBay, Terapy. It also exists on uh, PWCC's website. They mm -hmm. have at least 10 years of history um, data pulled st straight from eBay, but I don't think that they have the best offers information, uh, which eBay lacks as well. Which, so you have to go to a kind of the, one of those one-off tools, whether it be flipper tools or um, 130 count, 130-point Yep. Watch count used to be one of them. And then you can plug in the the uh, the transaction ID or um, 
item ID, and then it'll give you spit out a price. But to do anything more there would be very difficult. It's more for those like one off items. Yeah. So again, like just the data is very siloed. Um, varying histories across all these platforms. You know, one of the nice things that's kind of cool is that um, Card Ladder actually provides their proprietary opinion on what the card is worth. Um, but, you know, they only have a certain amount of cards in there, as it does, you know, Market Movers. I think Market Movers being the, the first adopter, uh, early adopter or first mover, they have the benefit of being able to get a few more cards in there. Um, we are both baseball fans. We know that <laughs> uh, the uh, baseball has been largely neglected by some of these tools in favor of basketball and, uh, and even football. Um, and, you know, that's where the demand is and that's where a lot of the flippers are. So I get it. it makes sense. But, um, you know, you also have to think about, like, where else do the sales take place outside mm -hmm. of eBay? 100%. eBay eBay reported some numbers this year. And undoubtedly, their cardboard sales are going up, um, probably went up a ton this year. Uh, year over year growth is probably insane for them. But at the same time, that doesn't mean they're expanding market share. There's other platforms like Instagram that's being used more than ever before, just like eBay, uh, Facebook. Uh, you have auction houses that are taking a lot of those illiquid high-end items, fractional ownership. Uh, you have you have uh, razes or lines if you want to get like super deep. You know, there's other places where transactions are taking place, um, and they're not being accounted for usually in the form of, um, or at least they're not being held to the same you know credibility as like, well, what mm -hmm. does eBay show is the last 90 days? I don't care if like you know somebody said that this guy's friend sold this card through Instagram, yeah. you know, and as a PayPal direct purchase, but, um, you know, it makes it difficult to, 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 to account for all this data. I don't know if you have any thoughts there. Yeah. I think it would be helpful to the viewers out there if we just lay out a story of the current landscape. So I love collecting Red Sox players. Um, I PC Nomar Garcia Parra and I'm a big Mookie Betts guy. If I want to see what his 2014 tops update has done over the last five years from a market standpoint, I can go to one of these, uh, the market movers and the card ladders of the world and get access to that data. However, if I'm going to eBay directly to the source and I'm using a, a service like Terapeak in order to query that eBay price, eBay sales history, I have to have a pretty high level of competence to be able to filter through, through like Boolean search queries, all of the garbage sales listings that pop up in that search. I can't just go in and type 2014 tops update Mookie Betts PSA 10, because you know what we're going to find? We're going to find lots in there. We're going to find BGS 95s, BGS 9s, potential crackout candidates, raw cards. You're going to have wax in there. It takes a high level of competency to be able to work through the, the bad data that's in there. And that's where market movers and card ladder are really helping the community because these Boolean searches that they've set up in their apps and in their websites, um, they really filter out all that garbage so that you can focus on what the actual sales data was. Um, but it's, it's disappointing that eBay has access to this information and they haven't come up with a consistent way to present those sales and tag individual items based on a certain like barcode or ISBN number. Yeah. And, and one of the things that bothers me um, is the amount of history that we have access to. And I sort of touched on that a little bit. But um, if you're to take this into the, the world of capital markets and specifically buying and selling stocks, and if you're making a decision, you know, do I want to buy, you know, 20 to 30 shares of Amazon if I have that money to spend? What's going to be important to you is, is, is it going to be the last 90 days, which you see on eBay, which you see on market movers, card ladder, and they've actually, you know, they've made some strides to build out histories for some other cards in their database. But, 
you know, and they're new and it's hard to get that data. So I completely understand, you know, we're not here to rag on those, those tools because they're great. Uh, especially what they can do from a visualization standpoint, in many ways, 100%. but, but uh, if taking it to the, to the baseball card world, like I, I want to know the transaction history longer than 90 days at a yeah. bare minimum. I need 12 months, if not 18 months of data. Um, you know, th there's, there are certain things that you get to see when you see a full year's worth of data. Not only do you have a larger sample size, but you're able to see cycles. So within a season, you get to see the season being played, um, ramp up before the postseason, the postseason, you get to see the off season, you get to see anticipation climb for the next season and the start of the next season. You know, those are all very, there's cyclical behaviors there that you want to kind of understand. You can also isolate out exogenous effects um, or events. If you think about um, a pandemic, you know, uh, bubbles popping, you know, uh, bubbles bursting just for whatever reason, which we've seen a couple of times over the last year that have affected different markets differently. Uh, influencers coming into the game and mm -hmm. pumping certain markets and being able to be able to understand like, OK, you know, that's the 52 week high. And that's where prices really started. Um, but even going back longer than a year is very beneficial, especially when looking at illiquid cards that don't sell very often. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, I don't know, 90, 1993 Topps Finest Refractor Berry Bonds in a PSA 10. You're not really going to have that many sales. It's like a pop 20, 30, maybe 40 max. And you, you want to see, you know, has that price doubled over the last three, four years? Has it tripled? And you kind of want to compare it to maybe other offerings, other more liquid cards at Berry Bonds to see if it's on the same pace. And I don't know if you um, you agree with me there with with the importance of data history that's longer mm -hmm. than 90 days. I mean, and, and, and Amazon's been around since in the 90s. So this isn't completely fair. Like a base prism Luka Doncic rookie um, or even something a little bit more ultra modern like a Zion rookie or uh, more recently, I guess, a uh, silver prism Joe Burrow rookie. Like some of these cards aren't going to have as many data points going back. And yeah. I understand that. But for the most part, I want the full extent of the data, whether we're talking sealed wax or if we're just talking singles. Yeah, I think there's a bunch of different ways we can go with this. But to focus on... Uh, one point in particular, if a new player is coming out, you can look to other players as a comp for what you want to predict that player's card performance to, to be. And what I mean by that is like when Zion was coming out, everyone was like, oh, uh, he's Larry Johnson 2.0. Well, if you are a firm believer in Zion and you think he is the second reincarnation of Larry Johnson, you better know what happened to Larry Johnson cards. Granted, back when Larry Johnson was in the NBA, like the the card world was a totally different universe, but you should have some baseline understanding of what his card market is and where it can be in order to better inform yourself as a Zion collector, investor, and speculator. But I think we have gotten so far away from even knowing what is acceptable in sort of what is available to us from a market price standpoint. And I want to illustrate this by just talking briefly about two other industries. The first is books. And books, if uh, I don't have one around me here, but every single book has an ISBN number. It is a global identifier. These ISBN numbers are assigned to publish uh, publishers that come out and they will publish books. They will assign, I think it's a 10 or a 13 digit ISBN number. Every single retailer across the globe will use that ISBN number as sort of the unique identifier for that book in log sales and log uh, transactions of that particular book that then they then report up to companies like Nielsen that will track the performance of a particular book. And that's how it's, it leads into sort of like the New York times bestseller list. 
Uh, but there are companies out there whose bread and butter is tracking these retail sales through a unique identifier like an ISBN number. And how easy would it be to assign a three-digit code to Tops, a three-digit code, code to Panini, Upper Deck, Leaf, four digits followed by that with the year, followed by the product itself, so that each card you pick up has a unique identifier. You can even add additional sort of characteristics to that number when that card gets graded. You can tag that ISBN number, that unique identifier, and now you have a common characteristic that all these marketplaces can use to identify and streamline how those items are being tracked. So that's, that's point number one. Point number two, in the hospitality industry, hotels know exactly how their neighbors are performing. And what I mean by that is if you are in Boston or right outside of Boston, there are 60 to 70 hotels in the city. They all have different levels of occupancy throughout the year. They all have different levels of sort of revenue per available room, whatever they're charging to customers. And what they do is at the end of the month and at the end of the quarter, they take all of their data that they've collected and they report it to a central body. They sort of opt into this self-reporting. And what do they get in return? This central body sort of anonymizes where that data is coming from and gives it back to the users. So if I'm running a hotel, I want to know what the other hotels in my comp set are doing. I am incentivized to report complete and accurate data to this sort of governing body, because if I don't do that, the neighbors, my hotel neighbors, my competitors are not going to do the same thing. So that's sort of your aligning interests of competitors to eliminate a market inefficiency in the availability of data. It's not necessarily pricing data. It's how much a hotel room costs and the occupancy at any given point in time. But those are just two industries that have it figured out. They got a standardized way across marketplaces to report the operations of the business. Now we hop back to sports cards. And what did we talk about five minutes ago? The journey and the different applications that we would need to hop back and forth on to figure out a trending price for a single card. Now, what happens if we wanted to dial it back and say, we want to look at the trending price of a particular sport or a particular wax product or a particular group of players? Like it, it is very cumbersome and it's very difficult for an individual to go out and do that now in an industry that's growing parabolically when there's no reason for it to be that way. Wow, that is deep. So I'll, I'll stop and catch, <laughs> catch, uh, catch some breath there. Yeah, that's some good stuff. Now, one of the things that not in the world we live in today, not everybody in a private transaction will be incentivized to disclose how much they paid uh, for a certain item or sold a certain item for based on their perception of if that was low or high for the market, I feel like, because it could hurt them in the future. Um, or people might you know, look at them a certain way if they undersold something. So is that something that this, this uh, model you're presenting would be able to solve for? Or? I think the short answer is no, because we can't sort of determine and decide the emotions and the behaviors of people. You can sort of price things different ways and hope the market will react positively to it. But um, I think what you're talking about is only really solved through sort of the tokenization of assets. And like Panini came out with their blockchain, which really isn't a blockchain. It's just some HTML coding that they're selling off as a blockchain. Um, but in order to get sort of full pricing transparency on a particular card or product, you would have to go the tokenization route. And that's an entirely different video in and of itself. But 
having something like that would enable you to contract the complete pricing and transaction history for a particular asset. And I think the question there is, would hobbyists, collectors, and investors place a premium on having access to that data? And because these sort of blockchain assets, these the tokenization of assets is in such an infancy stage, we don't really have an answer to how the market would react to that at this point. Interesting stuff. Wow. One of the things on a separate note, one of the things that uh, I've somebody, a contrarian um, approached me and said, you know, with the whole like data history thing with 90 days, maybe not being sufficient was my argument. Him saying that, well, if everybody has the same information disadvantage, does it matter? And the answer to that, my answer to that was, well, that data does exist and the savvy people are going to know how to access it. Mm -hmm. And, um, and you see it, you see it in Facebook groups, you see people getting, um, you know, I don't know what the term is, but not ripped off, but you're getting one pulled over on them. Yeah, yeah, it's just, and you see it with lines, you know, this is how I'm justifying my comps. And it's like, not everybody's going to be the same level. And data being siloed is um, is not going to help that that learning curve be any 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 uh, less harsh for uh, the new people in the hobby. And um, on, on that note, um, talking about information that's not available today or not easily available, especially to the folks that are newer to the hobby, something like market cap, um, which there's obviously a clear parallel with the investment or business world here and market cap in the context of sports cards would be generally you're speaking of all the copies of one specific issue of a card. Maybe it's in a certain grade and then taking that and multiplying it by the, the market value of that card potentially based on previously sold items off eBay or something. That's what mm -hmm. most people tend to use these days. And um, that's fine, you know, for today. But um, the market cap, and I know Card Ladders built this into their system. I think they have. And, and yep. maybe Market Movers has too. But to be able to have that on like a player-by-player -player basis, readily available instead of like a card-by-card -card basis, um, and maybe this is available, maybe it's not. It's just um, something that not a lot of people know about. Not a lot of people use this <laughs> and understand the power of mm -hmm. this. That um, That's a pretty good way of understanding relative overvalue and undervalued players looking at, and I know they brought this up. I don't know if you caught one of their more recent um, crossover. Uh, is that what they call it? Like the crossover podcast slash YouTube yeah. episode with Chris from House of Jordans and Josh from Cardboard Chronicles. Uh, definitely check them out. They put together a great, um, great thing there. And, um, and they were talking about Trey Young and Jamal Murray and just looking at their base prisms, maybe it was in PSA 10, and seeing that Trey Young was like times four market cap, times three or times four, whatever Jamal Murray was. Um, that's pretty. That's pretty powerful information. Mm -hmm. And you know, we play in the baseball world more. And if we were to look at like you know Jordan Alvarez, Bo Bichette, market values, and taking them like way back, might not be the best comp, but somebody like Miguel Cabrera, Albert Pujols, like. It would probably be pretty crazy what we would see, but that's if we took all of Bo Bichette's rookie cards in all yeah. grades, um, because there's quite a lot from this year, as you can imagine. So I think this could be something, the the, the whole market cap, um, the, the power of the market cap and using that to identify, is somebody cheap or are they really not? Mm -hmm. um, not completely fair because you also have the hype curves of a lot of these players and you're almost overpaying based on their potential. Um, future expected returns. Um, but still, still, you could see that a lot of these guys are probably a little too expensive right now. Maybe you should err on the side of caution before you like take a huge allocation in somebody whose cards started coming out in 2019 or 2020. Yeah, and uh, to piggyback off that point, I'm a big card ladder supporter and one of their OG users. And what you are alluding to, uh, they have something called a ladder. And on the ladder, they have different different types of things they track. And there's one ladder in particular called the player ladder, where they select what 
um, they believe to be the biggest card, rookie card for a particular player. And then those players are ranked based on the market cap for that card. And you'll see across all sports how those players are ranked. The problem with that is like if you look at Patrick Mahomes and his like prism silver, his rookie year, he only had a silver prism. He did not have a base prism. So if you're looking at it from a market market cap standpoint, there might be guys that are a lot less collectible. Let's take Josh Allen, for example. He might have a higher market cap for his base prism rookie in a PSA 10 just because there's more out there in the hobby or out there in the world. I don't think anyone with a straight face is going to go out there and say Josh Allen is a more collectible and valuable player than Patrick Mahomes. But like we can analogize this to advanced statistics in sports and advanced statistics in baseball. Batting average is one measure to look at how often a player gets on base. On base percentage is a better measure of how often a player gets on base. And then you get into WOBA, you get into WAR, you get into all these different sorts of metrics. And just going back to what you had said about Brian Gray's comment about us being in the second inning of this hobby, that's what what's happening on the data side of things as well. There's people that are starting to think about it in the ways that you just mentioned, but there's flaws in the approach and there's opportunity for someone to take those ideas and flush them out to come up with the, the data analytics in market pricing, um, the WOBA equivalent. And then that is the type of sort of KPIs and the statistics that can really make us more informed buyers in the marketplace. Good stuff. Good stuff there, Chris. So now moving on to possible solutions. And I know you had talked about a couple already, but specifically regarding data history and solving for that, is that something that's just going to be solved organically over time? Um, what, what do you see there in the future? Yeah. So right now, I think, like you said, it's it's either Terapeak or PWCC swung some type of sweetheart deal with eBay where they have access to their full pricing history, um, whereas a traditional sort of API key into eBay market prices and sales data only goes back a, a certain period of time. I think with like Nat Turner coming in, collect, uh, buying Collectors Universe, that's the start of the institutional money that's going to be pouring into the hobby. Someone's going to look at this problem and they're going to figure out a way to solve it. And the way they're going to do that is by padding eBay's pockets and getting access to sort of the complete unscrubbed version of their pricing history. Um, what that would enable this company to do is clean that data and put it into an easily usable format for collectors and investors to be able to do their own type of analyses over. Like we look at Michael Bloomberg eight months ago and he bankrolled his entire presidential campaign using his own money. And what is he known for? He created Bloomberg, like the, the data software platform. All it is is a data aggregator. He does not have, he does not own any of that data. He scrubs it from different places, puts it into a nice, neat dashboard for people that have a lot of money to digest. And he has made billions of dollars from that. I'm not saying that there's a Bloomberg-esque opportunity in the hobby here, but we can look at it and say, hey, it's a similar type story and no one has solved the problem quite yet. Yeah, I really like the asset management um, or financial services technology parallel there because if we're going to start to treat cardboards as an investable asset, then maybe we should look at other industries that are more mature and see what they've done. Um, granted, there's going to be a lot of stuff that's not going to be one for one. Stocks and fixed income securities and derivatives, they're just a lot more mature. Uh, mm -hmm. They have technology and data that's been around for a long time that's in a pretty good place <laughs> relative yeah. to, to sports cards. Uh, a very small market in comparison <laughs> would be an understatement. Uh, but 
Um, having said that, you know, there, so earlier this year, there was an acquisition of a company called IHS Market by, I think, S&P Financial. It was probably one of the largest acquisitions of the year. I believe 40 to $50 billion. That's how large this company is, IHS Market. So in addition to Bloomberg, um, and I know asset management companies very well, I understand that data is a cost that's even greater than technology for a lot of these firms. Bloomberg terminals are not cheap. Um, fact set, you've got vendors like Reuters for pricing information, you need benchmark information, you need security reference data. Um, and IHS Market has a role there too, and basically their business model is centralizing, storing, normalizing, synchronizing, and cleansing data. They don't do a whole lot with regards to like the downstream stuff that we see from the equivalent of like a market movers platform or card ladder. Mm -hmm. So maybe the eventual solution is, you know, there's, there's a, a player that decides to just tackle data. Uh, you talked about PWCC. Um, they are in an interesting spot because they've given a lot of money to Bloomberg. They made a lot of money, not Bloomberg. They've made a lot of money for eBay over the last, I don't know how long they've been in existence, but they've, there's clearly a reason why eBay is giving them the pricing data, probably unfettered access to it or whatever. Um, but they haven't done a whole lot from, from the data side. And that's maybe not something they deem to be their core competency. Yeah. Um, and I, maybe the answer is one of the analytics tools, like they partner with another firm that focuses on the data piece, but something has to be done. Um, eBay is sitting on all this data. It's more valuable than it's ever been. It's more abundant than it's ever been. It's more desired by everybody than it's ever been. There's more data scientists now than there's ever been to, to mine that data and to make use of that data in an efficient way. Uh, at some point, there has to be some sort of monetization of their data license. And maybe there's already some of that. I don't know about the back or the, the deals that they have with uh, the current players that get access to it. But eventually they've got to give up a little bit more of it and be paid for it. And they deserve to be paid for that. Because mm -hmm. again, data market movers and in card ladder, their number one asset, their most precious asset isn't really the technology itself i think it could be the data over time maybe it doesn't appear that yeah. way now but eventually you know that that might be the play of those platforms mm -hmm. yeah chris uh hoj from card ladder he says all the time that he wants the platform to have data that's such high quality that a like a graduate student could come in and write their thesis like a phd level thesis using their data and to put it into perspective, like they're adding 30 cards a day. They have a team of researchers that are going through and pouring card by card, making sure that the pricing history and the sales data that they're adding to the ladder is complete and accurate. Now, if you're talking about LHS markets coming in, I don't think they're going to have an appetite to like sick a team of like data crunchers and data analysts on such a, a manual process. I think when I was talking about like a standardization across the hobby of like a unique identifier to track assets, that is the missing piece. Like once you have that key identifier that all these platforms are using, like LHS would be willing to pay a mint to go in and, like purchase that data from eBay. And if I was an eBay shareholder, I'd be submitting shareholder letters to the company saying like, you have to go to the tops and the paninis and the upper decks of the world because this data is in such a large disarray that it's either gonna cost us a boatload of money, there's a big opportunity cost there right now of not doing anything. And yes, it's gonna be a Herculean effort to apply that unique ID to like past card releases. But for every release that comes out that that unique identifier isn't being applied to, that backlog uh, that eBay has to work through, like just keeps getting bigger and bigger. So I, like, I think it's the elephant in the room that no one's talking about. And it's, right. it's the skeleton key that would open up 
the doors to limitless opportunities as it relates to the data science side of the hobby. Yeah. And, and just to clarify, I didn't mean like IHS market, the company itself would get into the space. I meant a company with a similar mission to them, another startup perhaps, mm -hmm. um, like the ones that have come in the hobby already focuses on just that data piece. Um, but let's move on to the next thing. So we talked about solutions for data history. Now let's talk about solutions for data quality or like the completeness of data. Um, anything else you, you foresee being, uh, being in the works? Uh, being in the works? No, <laughs> uh, but I mean, I'm in audit. I, that's what my day job is. And, um, it's not our job to go out and identify fraud, but when there are um, people that are committing fraud, the, the hardest thing to sort of identify in the process is when two people are colluding with one another. Because the only way you're ever going to detect that is if one of the people that's colluding comes clean. So if you're looking at collusion in the hobby, all it takes is someone bidding up another card for their friend or they're bidding up their own card in a false account or there's there's a card that isn't paid for to like hit that collusion threshold and it is very expensive to try and solve that problem so i think sort of the best way to root out the problem is to self police in the hobby um, which is not a great answer, but I think the hobby is as, I don't know, positive and willing to collaborate and come together as any that I've ever been a part of. So if there's like a way for us to band together and stop shill bidding and no purchases, I mean, no payment on purchases, I think that's the best way to to get at data quality, which is like a pretty shitty and inefficient answer. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you look at shill bidding and it presents a lot of problems. Um, overstates asset prices or card prices, sometimes it's not caught quick enough where by the time it's cleansed, which will be, you know, there'll be two different takes of the cleansing, the market movers team versus the, the card ladder team versus whoever else, eBay, <laughs> eventually they need to, you know, cleanse that from their system if it's not really paid for. If it is paid for, then you still have market movers team and car ladder like, okay, like, does this look legit? Let's look at like, is this really an outlier? Who, um, the number of feedback that paid for the item, um, you look at like the bidding war that occurred, if it was like two bidders that have spent, that have done a lot of activity with that same seller. Um, if you click into it from a PC, you can actually see that information. With a PWCC auction, you can't because as we talked about um, offline, they're doing all their auctions from here on out, I guess, as private listings. So you can't see any individual information. So to detect shilling, I guess, you know, removes the liability from them, but that's a nightmare for, for everybody else. Um, you know, you look at, and I think we've done a disservice by not bringing up VCP yet, uh, the vintage card pricing platform, which I've heard really great stuff about actually. And the nice thing about that is that it's, there's one place to go to for all vintage and every, but people that collect a vintage, buy vintage, invest in vintage, they, they have a hundred percent or not a hundred percent. They have a lot of confidence in that platform and there's only one of them. So you don't have siloed data again. Mm -hmm. um, and they get data from multiple places, I think the auction houses as well as yeah. eBay, to their benefit, the transaction volume on a lot of stuff they're capturing is probably a lot lesser than the modern stuff across all sports, I would think, yeah. um, which presents a lot of the issues, capacity, um, getting back to like timely data, accurate data. Okay, like, you know, you guys fix the data, but did you do it quick enough? By the time you fix it in your platform, people already acted on the bad information. Yeah. Uh, whether it was paid for or not, you know, <sighs> there there could have been, and I've seen shill bids happen. I've seen market values affected by that. The two more prominent examples was uh, US 175 mic drop PSA 10. Recently it broke 2000. I think it was the second time it broke it. And I saw two or three auctions in a row where that took place. Um, it's all about getting like enough of those fake auctions back to back to back. 
And then all of a sudden you see the bin prices starting getting bought at higher prices than what they should be. And then all of a sudden the market value is affected for the long term, really, for the next few months. I also saw it happen with uh, Conor McGregor, um, the Young Guns PSA 10. David. I, I told you about this. Yeah, it jumped. Yeah. And I was trying to buy like two or three of them. Yeah. And it jumped from $650 to 1000 And there were like three phony auctions, maybe five, maybe three to five. And they're all Probstein. Um, mm. And they all happen like back to back to back to back before there are any other auctions that were legitimate. And it, like stringing those together has a powerful effect on people because they're not, not everybody's going to click on each auction, understand the seller, look at the bidding history, click into the bidders. Um, it's in from an app that's very hard to do. Most people buy sports cards from their app and not the computer. But uh, enough on that point. So I, I kind of agree with you a little bit in that like to solve like the, there needs to be some centralization, some effort to like self-report the data that occurs from sales off the platform of eBay. That's the only way we'll be able to do it. And if we're able to get half of those sales that occur off the off off of eBay and not the full extent of it for whatever reason, we talked about incentives, not wanting to disclose what they paid, what they sold an item for, then that would be a lot better than what we have today. Yeah, for sure. And I think like we're talking about data tonight, but there's an equal opportunity in marketplaces in general to create a better customer experience. Um, eBay's managed payment system is sounding like it's been very difficult for some people. ComC has had big hiccups. Star Stock is showing a lot of promise, but it's still not it's still in its its infancy and there's it's their own logistical problems with that. So I think like eBay is the king now, but Blockbuster was the king in the late 90s. So I don't think eBay should sort of sit on their laurels and take everything for granted. They need to continue to make the, the customer experience better, but then the seller experience as well. And then I, I just want to touch on a definition real quickly, because I wrote this down in preparation for tonight's conversation. And it's the definition of what a perfect market is in economic terms. And just listen when I read this definition out on how far the sports card market is from a perfect market, a theoretical market where buyers and sellers are so numerous and well informed that a monopoly is absent and prices cannot be manipulated. I feel like we check off one of those boxes where there are buyers and sellers so numerous and that's pretty much it. And when the market is that far off from perfection, you're never going to reach the theoretical um, market perfection. But when we're as far off as we are, there's serious problems that need fixing. Yeah, um, I was watching Slab Stocks. All these names just sound the same to me. <laughs> Slab Stocks, uh, they have a YouTube channel and I was watching their Q&A and uh, listening to it. And they had mentioned something like, one of the reasons why we're not entering a new jack junk wax era, or it's not as likely we will, is because there's a lot more data these days versus in the 90s where e-commerce, eBay, Instagram, we, we have a better understanding today of what's out there in circulation with regards to pops. Well, pops, obviously, that's that's probably always been there for, for PSA's sake. Mm -hmm. um, but print runs, we have a better understanding of the print runs versus 95. You had to kind of go to one show in Los Angeles, then maybe you go to another one in um, San Francisco, Sacramento, and you're like, okay, there's a lot of Griffey Jr. 89 upper decks here, um, but I still don't know how many there are. Maybe there's only you know a, a million when they're really probably closer to 3 million, you know, just as an example. Um, what I would say to that is we've come a long way, but there's certain things like market cap, siloed information. There's still information disadvantages, lacking history. And this next thing I'm going to bring up is very important, which we haven't talked about yet. And that has to do with quantifying the market. So what is the market? Um, thinking about like an index, like the S&P 500, a market composite that is representative of how well the 
market as a whole has performed over the last 30, 60, 90 days, 52 weeks, three years, five years. Right now, there are very few indices, indexes. Um, PWCC has a few indexes. You know, but PWCC, what they have, is that really indicative of what the market is, especially with all of these data tools being centered around flipping and modern cards? Um, we talked about this earlier, but more dominated towards the basketball and football sides. I had a chance to dig through PWCC's largest index. Uh, they have a 100 card index, a 500 card index, a 2500 card index, and I think a few variations of that 2500 card index. And it's vintage dominated. It's multiple sports. 80% of the cards are from before 1972. I'm talking about the 2500 name list. And uh, the 100 and 500 are baked into those 2500 names. So 80% of the cards are from pre-1972. There's no cards from after 1999. I actually thought it was interesting that Josh Hamilton's rookie from 99 was in their <laughs> PSA 10. So, but, but still, PWCC, uh, there's a conflict of interest there. Should they be the ones that are providing this data to us that we're relying on, given that their business model relies on commission based off of how much an item sells for it directly related to that. So not trying to shit on, I'm just saying, you know, maybe there's room for other data providers in this industry. Um, and, but again, like what they have, is it really, is, is it indicative of the market to you, to, to us? Is it one that you could replicate if you wanted to even the hundred name list? I mean, I think with fractional ownership, you could probably get to some of those cards and they're not all PSA tens. There's PSA sixes in there. Um, actually, you know what? Why don't I share my screen real quick? Well, while you're bringing that up, I will say that before Vegas Dave bought the Mike Trout Bowman Chrome Super Fractor, the market's holy grail across sports was the 52 Mickey Mantle. And before that, it was the T206 Honus Wagner. So... I'm willing to put money on the fact that PWCC developed that um, market price index when those cards were the king. That's why you see Josh Hamilton in in that listing. And they aren't going in and they aren't actively updating that to account for these massive cards that are that have been sold within the last couple of years. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's... It's you can give them some credit for potentially not changing out cards and cherry picking what those cards are. Um, this seems to be so. I I looked into the um, you know the process for how they gathered the data. They grabbed the data from eBay as well as I think VCP, mm -hmm. and uh, um, I believe it is a, a market cap weighted index, which I guess the alternative would be a uh, equal share weighted market cap is probably the way to go. But you know, this is this is just one one stab at it. This is just one approach. And you see, you know, we're at 1700 names, we're still still in the 60s. This is all sorted by date, we started with the 1800s, there's more cars from the 1800s than the, than the 2000s. So, you know, maybe this is the market, maybe it's not. It's not something that we'd want to use as a benchmark, you know, to measure our performance against because it's yeah. not representative of the expected return that, you know, we're probably shooting for. And it's certainly not representative of the assumed risk that a lot of us are taking dabbling into that modern space. Um, you know, it's, it's priced quarterly, which is okay. But like today, like this day and age, like you think you'd want like monthly data, weekly data, maybe even daily. Like, why is it quarterly? Like, you see how fast things are changing. You know, for mm -hmm. vintage, maybe not that big of a deal, but still, a lot of things gonna happen. We saw a lot of stuff happen this year that affected vintage prices. Um, you know, and, and I go back to asset management or financial services technology, where they have concepts of indices or baskets, as well as benchmarks. And I think that there's opportunity, going back to the solutions, with 
having introducing some baskets. They could be specific to the sport. And I know we had talked about how Starstock actually um, created a basket or some sort of an index with all of or some basketball prism base rookies, which is cool to see because I haven't really seen that offered anywhere else. Um, but, you know, being able to, to kind of have that per sport, per set, per era, there's a lot of different ways you can slice things. And that would give us a good understanding of, you know, basically answering some basic questions that we can't answer today. So today, you know, and this is all, this all has to do with the state of the data and the, the pain of basically that Cardi C and I are dealing with, but there's certain basic questions that can be answered. Like what's the hottest sport of the month? You know, you could slice it in different ways. You know, you, maybe you could answer the question differently depending on your metrics for uh, your barometer for what does hot mean? Um, you know, when did modern basketball overtake baseball? Again, you know, there could be multiple dates here, you know, but to be able to see that data over time, mm -hmm. you know, to have like specific baskets that could measure securities across modern baseball, modern basketball, that'd be very interesting. Um, has Topps flagship overtaken Bowman? And if so, when? You know, wh what are the size of these markets today? Um, how have they evolved over the last 24 months? How have they evolved compared to the price of sealed wax over the last 24 months? Is there evidence of Topps flagship cannibalizing Bowman? You know, and, you know, e comparing each of those, you can compare each of those Topps and Bowman versus the broader modern baseball market to try to figure that out. And uh, with football and basketball, how has Select performed as a brand versus Optic and Prism? Everybody says that, you know, Optic, the cards, or Select, the cards are undervalued. They're nicer. They're expensive. Uh, the pop counts are low relatively compared to Prism and Optic. Select gained ground on Optic and Prism over the last three years. And further, how has, like, the Select courtside and field level parallels performed against Prism Base over the last three years? Um, Mike Trout, how has he performed in baseball versus all of the Bowman prospect autographs across the entire universe of Bowman over the last three years? How has Mike Trout performed against Mickey Mantle over the last 10 years? All cards, or just looking at rookie cards. Um, Mantle's case, add in the 52 tops. Uh, vintage versus modern. You know, and be able to slice that different ways. So there's certain questions that we just, I feel like, can't. Either we don't have the information or we can't easily get to it. Or mm -hmm. if we could get to it, then there would be arguments because it would be subjective analysis based on flawed assumptions, poor data. Yeah, for sure. I think you make a lot of great points there. And each one of those questions you rattled off, my brain is spinning. I'm like, this would be a, a great video. People would want to see that. But the cost benefit of spending the time to scrub the data and pull that together, you're talking 40 to 60 hours to put an analysis together with a theory that could potentially just be bogus. Um, the There's nothing more unsatisfying than going through like the process to analyze something with a theory in mind for the data to not prove that out. Something I'd like to see is like, the hobby decided that prism silvers were the card to get one day and then like the flick of a switch optic hollows were just as collectible why like there's no easy way to prove that out without having the information in those those baskets like you were talking about and being able to to look at where we've been will allow us to make better decisions on where something can go. And I don't know if anyone is in the hobby or in flipping or they call themselves an investor, like that's the information you want your hands on. You don't want to see that like bull bull traded $20 higher today than he did yesterday. Cause he's going to be down 60% two weeks from now. You want to know what that next big thing is, what, the kaboom is what the downtown insert is not of today, but of tomorrow. So you can go out and pick those cards up and be the first mover on that. Yeah. And in, in the, the market participants 
hobby hobbyists are becoming smarter and quicker in getting that edge. Um, clearly, there's been a large influx of investors that have come in this year, and a lot of them came in the first half or the first quarter of the year. So they've gotten more sophisticated. So if you look at something like values for a player that is um, about to make it or get announced that he will be inducted into the Hall of Fame, so that when that announcement comes, the drive up in prices is happening a lot sooner than it did a year ago or two <laughs> years ago. So to be able to look at that, those relationships over time, how they've changed, how the psychology of investors is reflected into you know, market prices, basically. Um, a, a better example of that might be the anticipation of the season beginning and that off-season hype starting a lot sooner. We saw it with modern modern basketball, or sorry, modern football. We saw it probably in what April, May. Yeah. Um, first prism or uh, prism rookies for a lot of those key quarterbacks were going up. Daniel Jones, et cetera, everybody. Um, so that was interesting to see. So there's there's a lot that data could help us understand and um, be even smarter than we are today. Like our bread and butter is baseball. And the last five years, the baseball off season has been right around Thanksgiving. And then two to three weeks after that going into December, that's when you're going to get rock bottom low prices. And we're right in the middle of that time period now. And you know what? Like that period came two to three weeks earlier than it, it has historically. And we have to ask ourselves, why are there more market participants trying to get in and trying to get their guys at rock bottom prices earlier? They're making decisions under the assumption that the market is behaving the way it always has been. When in actuality, that market they were looking for is two, three weeks in the past. They're a day late and a dollar short. Yep, exactly. And one of the last things I want to bring up here with regards to potential solutions or things that could potentially give us more information and make uh, this data, data a little bit more palatable for us. And you could, maybe you, you'd disagree with me here. Um, and maybe I'm thinking 10 years down the line. And maybe I'm thinking from an institutional mindset for the, the players that are launching funds that are actually going to be managing funds and acting as a fund manager maybe this would be more of the use case for when you would need something like this. But specifically, I'm thinking about risk analytics. Um, today, everybody is so laser focused on return potential, expected returns, guaranteed returns, and not a lot of people are focusing on risk. Some are, but to a less quantifiable extent. Um, could be subjective, you know, well, this guy's like here and like, you know, Michael Jordan and LeBron have like the same amount of risk. Well, probably not, but I kind of get what you're saying. Um, and all those modern players, you can almost like give it a, a different risk factor to each one of them. But, you know, I don't know what the answer is. Like, I don't know how to compute a player specific risk. Maybe it's as simple as, I don't know how simple it would be, but standard deviation of returns. So like um, range of expected outcomes, yeah. you know, with, with that's something that you see in, in capital markets. Um, if you look at stocks, they have beta. It's like yeah. the un undiversifiable risk, you know, of um, how much risk the stock adds to like a pre-existing portfolio. Um, not one for one there because 1.0 is like the average. And I don't know. I don't know how you do that. And, and like with, if you look at debt instruments, you have all these different, like you have interest rate risk, you have... Um, risk of default, credit ratings, et cetera. But you know, these asset classes do have risk um, analytics associated to them, those more conventional instruments. And you've got to think like at some point, is it possible? Is it feasible? Will there be demand to, to understand risk and to maybe have that be part of market movers card ladder, not just at the individual card level, but to also be able to have like a portfolio, an aggregate measure of risk across your entire portfolio. Maybe mm -hmm. you can compare that over time. Um, it can make you, maybe it provide you a better understanding of whether it makes sense to, to tilt your portfolio towards a specific sport or era. Um, maybe you can look at that portfolio versus your conventional 401k and kind of understand where your total risk is across all assets. I don't know. 
Yeah, I think the missing piece to that right now is the marriage of objective KPIs that are outside of the card market. So what has football and baseball and hockey and basketball viewership done? And how does that correlate to the prices of sports cards? If you're looking at an individual player, if their war is going up, is there a direct impact? Is there an indirect impact to their market prices? Do you see some type of 15 to 20 day lag where people take some time to recognize that a player is heating up? So now I'm going to go buy their cards. But there's no mechanism out in the, the universe, <laughs> to the best of my knowledge, unless someone's built it on their own, that pulls in those objective KPIs for us to be able to do that type of analysis. And when you're talking about risk and beta, like the things that I would want to see is like, how often is Zion mentioned in articles and TV interviews or Twitter mentions? And how does that relate to his, his prices? It's al almost, how can you objectively quantify hype? Like you said, mm. risk, I said hype, uh, but it, it ultimately gets down to how collectible a player is, a brand is, a sport is. And I don't know what the future holds for that, but I would be 100% on board and throw my money behind someone that's able to, to crack the case. Because as a collector, it gets back to those questions you were asking. Like, I want to find the answers to those questions. I want to watch content created around that. And it'll just make my collecting experience uh, just that much more complete. Got it. Yeah, I, I, I agree with you there. And, you know, risk analytics, if we ever do get to that point, I do think it'll have to take the shape of some sort of industry accepted, widely adopted measure. Um, it's not going to be something that you kind of create in a vacuum and start using on your own. Next topic, the current tools in the marketplace, the star stocks, the Ebays, the Terra Peaks, the car ladders, the market movers, um, stock X has some analytics capabilities, um, very light, but they do have something, you know, how do you see those tools evolving to provide greater insights in the future with more improved data? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, I don't have, this is not insider knowledge, like, Besides a, a few DMs with some folks, I, I don't know what's going on in the, the minds of these people, but just speaking more broadly about the technology out there, uh, there's machine learning and AI that is becoming more and more accessible to people like you and I. Instead of needing to know advanced mathematics and R programming and like building out a predictive model on our own, there are tools that are being enhanced like Tableau and Power BI that can help you do that. Um, and there's there's tools out there that you can sort of build your own machine learning algorithm without having to have a PhD in statistics. And when you introduce something like machine learning into just the, the data upload process for each of these tools and you teach it to identify what is a bad transaction and what is a good transaction. Um, what are the cards we should be adding? What are being most transacted that aren't currently being tracked on our platform? It's going to make their platforms just that much more intelligent and that much more timely in getting data back to the end user. Because I know right now the system of where sort of the cards are being added and how it's it's being decided is largely like put out to a vote or if there is some people at either of the, the startups that are identifying which cards most people are interested in. But it would be a lot more effective if you had an objective way to identify what those cards are. And theoretically, if you're adding the best, the brightest, the most popular cards to your system, timely, you're going to attract more people to the platform. So I think yeah. it, like baby steps, like you got to walk before you can run. Let's take care of the basic blocking and tackling first. 
But if you're looking at a three to five year horizon, if if either of these companies are still around by then, I think that's sort of the type of thing you got to be looking at. Machine learning, AI, crazy stuff. I didn't even think about that. Maybe I was thinking more one to two years out. Um, and and back, back to the parallels with like, OK, if this is truly an investment, let's treat it like an investable asset. Um, the uh, market movers tool, it started as more of like an eBay pricing tracker, you know, uh, now you have the ability to track your inventory in it and some P&L associated with that. So, you know, you can see your overall value that's been gained with like up to date market values and you you input your sales information, you get your realized gains and losses that way. Um, I would like to see them carry that forward more. Um, I would like to see the tools do perhaps a better job um incorporating pop report data if they haven't already i know in in some areas of the tool that's available of probably each of them uh certainly card ladder um i'd like to see these tools take steps with analysis and visualization maybe making it a little bit cleaner nicer improve like the ability to navigate um you know the descriptive analytics that's more of like what I'm talking about, like what's happened in the past versus like, you know, predicting what's going to happen in the future. I'd like to see them kind of build upon that foundation more before mm. they get to anything crazy where you're forecasting or like when you started talking about AI, I was thinking about like an optimization model, you know, backing into yeah. using some risk information um, the way I would do it, but as well as return information and then back into like a, this is your optimal portfolio or this is what you're missing. This is what you need to buy at any given time with like real time information. That'd be crazy. Mm -hmm. um, but I would like uh, you log into Yahoo Finance and what do you see? You see the market, you see S&P 500, you see you know your top movers some things you own, some things maybe you're tracking. You do have those capabilities inside uh, Market Movers to be able to add favorites, uh, but you don't have the S&P 500 because you don't know what that market is. So eventually getting to that concept of benchmarks or not benchmarks, but indices, indexes, or uh, baskets, uh, something beyond what PWCC is offering today, I think that would be a huge step forward. Um, Terapeak needs a uh, needs a major overhaul i think the database is 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 garbage uh for lack of a better word to describe that i mean it's um it doesn't i actually was able to see like user feedback on it uh online <laughs> it's been like reviewed and uh people don't like it either um not just not just us yeah uh, you know maybe maybe with like market movers in card ladder they could incorporate exposure information so with traditional invest instruments like bonds and stocks you want to you want to understand your um your exposures across like country with stocks growth and value industry with bonds you want to see your exposures across like maturity credit rating high yield muni corporates for cards okay less mature very different than the conventional instruments but might help you to understand exposure across like grading companies what's my how diversified am i across grades or across eras of player um, across sets, across sports, across different dollar value bands, um, which could be a way of measuring like illiquidity, perhaps, and attract this over time. Uh, I think that would be helpful to have that information in there potentially. I guess so. We're running a little bit long. Uh, I want to jump to the one of the last questions we have. Uh, do you think it? You think we're at the place now? You know, you talked a little bit about AI, about machine learning. You touched upon that. Do you think right now we're ready to apply predictive analytics to the sports card market? I think you can try, but we got to take care of the blocking and tackling first. Uh, you have descriptive analytics and diagnostic analytics. And when you're looking at descriptive analytics, it's really what happened. And if you can't, if it takes you more than, an hour to get a clean data set that you can load into a visualization tool to try and look back at what happened. Like you can't move into the diagnostic phase of figuring out where it has happened. 
there's definitely some sophisticated users out there that might have an API key into eBay and they've got their own algorithms and their own Excel spreadsheets that are sort of cleansing the data along the way. And they might be in a position to like put in predictive analytics into play, but anyone that is sort of out there marketing themselves as like, here is the predictive analytic solution that I am providing. They're doing it on an Excel spreadsheet and they're just running through scenario analysis. Uh, true predictive analytics involves a high level of mathematics and programming that like software engineers and data scientists really are the only ones equipped to be able to do. Um, but I think just taking a step back, you need the data to be good. It needs to be clean. It needs to be cleansed. You have to have a high level of integrity and uh, be able to place a high level of reliance on that data. And I think what card ladder and market movers are doing is helping us get there. But there's 6,500 cards or so um, listed on card ladder right now. And they're trying their best to get as many cards added to them as quickly as they can. But how many cards are out in the, the, the card universe right now? There is so much more. It's like we're, we're wading into Mariana's trench and we don't know how deep it goes. So I think predictive analytics is possible for some very, very bright people that are thinking about it the right way. Um, the best and brightest content creators are probably in the diagnostic analytics bucket. And then the rest of us that are just transacting based off of recently sold comps are on eBay are firmly in the, the descriptive analytics phase. Yeah. Okay. So you broke that down a little bit different than I would. Um, but one of your analogies you said earlier was, you know, you got to crawl before you can walk or walk before you can run. And there's a lot of startups and companies I can't even keep track of. Um, I have two examples here, and I think I've shared both of these with you already. But five, six months ago, somebody in a Facebook group that I'm a part of said that he was, as part of his grad school, he was, um, I'm not going to name the person or the, the company because it's not uh, appropriate to do so, but he's working on an ability to Basically, indices and all that stuff was great, I thought. But I, I think the end game was to have predictive analytics tools as part of that. And two months after he told me this idea, I was trying to create a video and I was trying to see whether um, how tops update rookies in PSA 10s compared to Bowman Chrome autographs with those same players, first Bowman Chrome autographs um, over over the last like two years. And he claimed, uh, you know, he used the word dislocation. You know, we can see if there's a dislocation. He used it twice. I still don't know what that means. Um, <laughs> and that's part of the issue. These tools, you know, forget about like you and I who are more technically savvy than most. These need to be adopted by layman people. These need to be adopted by the target market of flippers and investors that often are just business people, just entrepreneurs or just average folks, you know that might not have time to understand the, the limits of a Tableau or a Power BI, um, or just don't have the inclination to, to do that type of thing. So you know, not being able to, he, he came back and he said, you know, kind of like a, I don't know, like a political type response, like, well, you know, it's tough to tell because your sample size of data isn't big enough. When I showed him my data and I'm like, well, you know, you're not helping me answer the question. I came to you because you were supposed to give me the answer. Going back to, we have all of these basic questions that we can't get answered today. That's where we should start. And looking mm -hmm. at this, you know, start with crawling, descriptive analytics, then focus on why it happened. Then after that, once you have a decent foundation, a set of data that you, everybody can rely on, it's been cleansed, it's been centralized, synchronized, it's timely all of the the data across the entire marketplace is there maybe once covid's over pricing data from shows is there um talked about it's not just pricing data it's also index data or basket data that would be very very helpful um 
I think you have to figure out that before you take it a step further. And then later today, my second example is there is another person who um, actually, I think it started about four days ago in a Facebook group. He posted, what's your number one pain point in the hobby? And this is an investor oriented Facebook group. And I was the only one that responded, data is my issue. I said completeness, timeliness, and quality of data, I believe. And he responded, how would you solve that? You know, and I was going to tell him, wait a couple of weeks and I'll show you a link to the YouTube video and that'll give you some <laughs> ideas because I can't put it in writing. Yeah. And I want to be paid for it. Just kidding. But no, it'd be nice <laughs> to get paid for it. Everybody else on that thread, their number one pain points were too many flippers in the hobby, too many shill bidders, eBay selling fees suck. You know, just like stuff that can't be solved yeah. by a person that's clearly working on some sort of startup technology. Um, but needless to say, this person followed up today and I shared you the article. He's working on some really advanced predictive analytics solution, it appears to be. Uh, it was more of an article than actually describing something tangible that's ready to be sold, I feel like. But he's focusing on something that I think is a little bit more than what we need right now. Um, yeah. I don't know. What the, do you ho the hobby has a very short attention span. Um, I mean, I say that as we're going on an hour plus for <laughs> the conversation tonight. But what I mean by that is 12 months ago, the biggest item in all of our minds was the trimming scandal. And we were talking about the inefficiency and the ineffectiveness of the distribution model and how retail was dead. And like you, we have to go to hob, uh, hobby shops to get anything, any wax that's worthwhile. It's night and day compared to where we're at now. And it, it makes me excited, but also nervous for where we are, are going to be a year from now. Um, Cause there's going to be problems that pop up that are, we're not even thinking about and they aren't even on our radar. But to get back to your point, the average collector out there is going to pop open eBay, go to recently sold comps for a particular player, and they'll see the top three or four. They're not going to look at like the best offer accepted price. They're just going to see that top line number that got striked out on eBay. And that's what they're going to be transacting off of. So until there's a solution and an easily sort of packageable and digestible application or platform that's able to show people like, here's what something is actually worth. We're not going to be able to look at why Topps flagship is starting to outperform Bowman Chrome or vice versa. Like we got to figure that stuff out before we can start answering the bigger, better, brighter questions. Um, but that just creates opportunity for anyone that's willing to step up to the plate and take a chance. Indeed. And actually, there's one point in there I forgot to mention, Beckett. So when I got back into the hobby in 2014 pretty hard, I subscribed to Beckett because I didn't know better. Because brand recognition in the 90s, I knew Beckett's prices were inflated, but I figured they'd clean that up. I knew there was a conflict of interest with a grading company. But mm -hmm. the fact that they were associated with a grading company, I figured like, oh, they, they probably their prices are probably reliable now. <laughs> and, <laughs> um, and but one of the things that Beckett does that most of the other sources, data providers, tools don't offer, except for I think Card Ladder, is some sort of proprietary valuation on what the card's worth. Beckett's methodology is um, probably very loosely defined, maybe not defined at all. It's lagged. It's just a, it's bad, but it would be kind of cool to be able to have, especially for the illiquid items, especially for the items that think about like parallel variants, refractors, where their value is derived off of another issue of that card, the base, maybe the an answer in the future involves actually having pricing data that's separated, still factoring in, you know, sale data as being like a major component of how those prices are, you know, computed, but, Maybe, you know, maybe have regular pricing would be a good way to, to do it too. 
Yeah, a hundred percent. Could not agree with you more. And you know, uh, I'll give Mar uh, my man Jeff Wilson, Market Movers, uh, from Market Movers, some credit here. He does have a, a key ratios um, tab as part of one of the functions offered in the tool, where you can kind of do some of that relative valuation and analysis yourself in the uh, in the charting. So, um, you know, the ratios are very important. Uh, it's also very important to have them for at least 12 months, if not 18 months, I think. But we talked about that earlier in, uh, in detail with uh, the lack of data history. Um, although these tools are, are working on it, everybody is understanding that data is a gap. They're all spending countless hours trying to fix that for us. So give them a lot of credit. The tools today are much improved versus where they were even a year ago, never mind five years ago, where we had basically nothing. Uh, mm -hmm. scraps. So any final thoughts, Chris? I think the only, the only aspect of data that we didn't talk about is our personal data as it relates to um, like our purchase history and what we're interested in and what's lighting up our watch feeds. Like I just got my 2020 Spotify year in review that broke down the watch minutes that I spent listening to Kygo versus Disney music versus like it, it runs the gambit, but how cool would it be if eBay were to come out with something that's like, here's the players you've most watched. Or if you're using like card ladder has a watch list function, like here's how often you checked in on a particular player, like on our platform. And I mean, it's, it's a kitschy way to just like reflect on what you've done the last year. But it's also an opportunity for you to look back and have some self-reflection. Like, were, was I collecting the bull bulls of the world or was I like a Kobe MJ collector? And is that where I want to be moving forward? You can sort of start to identify trends in your own collecting that you want to um, course correct on or, or continue with. So that's something we haven't even talked about that I think is is like near and dear to a lot of our hearts when we're talking about data privacy and sort of what we are as consumers are putting out into the, the analytics world. That is something I didn't even consider at all. Uh, but that's very, that's very valid. Well, that is about uh, all the time we have for today. Chris, thanks so much for being on. Uh, let us know in the comments what you think. You know, are we exaggerating this issue? Is it not an issue that you have? Do you understand the pain? Are we talking nonsense? Uh, thanks a lot for staying the entire time or, you know, flipping to the end so you could, uh, whatever, you know, maybe try to catch some flip notes if you had to. But uh, thanks a lot, guys, for watching. Like, comment, please subscribe to Filmington out. Thanks, Chris, for joining. Take care, guys.